Hey everyone, I'm Hudson, and in this approach in the scene, I'm going to take you on a road trip to Washington State's Palouse uh, and kind of go over some of the things that didn't go exactly as I planned on this photo road trip and some of the tips and tricks that I've developed over the years to kind of deal with changing situations, ways of adapting to the weather and park closures and things that just kind of crop up unexpectedly and get in the way of what you had planned for a photo shoot. So again, I'm Hudson, I'm a Portland, Oregon based photographer and photo educator and approaching the scene is a series of videos that I'm producing on sort of everything photographic and everything visual storytelling. You know, the technology in this digital age is advancing at such a rapid rate that it's hard to keep up with and between, you know, tools that we have for capture, tools that we have for post-production, the convergence of video, the convergence of time lapse. You know, I really envision this series developing into kind of a conversation between all of you who are interested in watching. And I hope, by the way, you'll click subscribe and, and like on these videos. It really helps a lot. Uh, and also, you know, other professionals that I run into in the field and some discussions and conversations and tips and tricks about post-processing and capturing better images in the field. So. Uh, if you want to contribute to the conversation, I take questions at the end of every episode. I'm going to take a couple of your questions at the end of this episode. You can submit those questions at questions at HudsonHenry.com. Just email them to questions at HudsonHenry.com. Or you can go to the website. Go to www.HudsonHenry.com slash ATS. It stands for Approaching the Scene. So HudsonHenry.com slash ATS. And just add those questions there. I really want you to join the conversation and I hope you'll submit them. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to jump into this road trip to the Palouse. I was with a good friend of mine, Woody. For those of you who, who may have taken a workshop with me or been involved in any kind of a business sense, Woody's a frequent co-conspirator and good buddy of mine. And we were really going to the Palouse this last spring uh, just to kind of case the joint out, to go check it out, see what's there, and get ready for maybe doing a workshop up there this next spring, which I am in the course of planning right now. Uh, and we took the Sprinter van and we just dashed up there. And I'm just gonna, gonna jump on the computer here and, and run through some images from the trip. So we, uh, we had you know, a plan for going up there for about three days and just photographing everything. We wanted to stop at Palouse Falls on the way, you know, just go up to some of the most famed places. I had uh, a couple of photographers that I talked to and got some information about places to go. Obviously, you know, if you've been to the Palouse, Steptoe Butte is a place you want to spend a lot of time. And we thought we might just park up there with the van and shoot dawn and dusk, maybe even twice. Um, but as we drove up the Columbia River Gorge, out east on the Columbia River Gorge, uh, you could see that we were driving into, I'd read there were potential thunderstorms, but you could just see this massive front of thunderheads that we were heading into sort of to the north and to the east of us right where we're headed. And you kind of get a little, little feeling in the pit of your stomach. So we stopped in Hermiston. Uh, there's Woody, grabbed some really great burritos at this little taqueria uh, market. I remember it as a high point of the trip for food. It was actually just cheap and incredible. So it's really obvious there's a little taqueria in Hermiston. If you're going through Hermiston, Oregon on your way over uh, across the river or coming back, great little spot for tacos and, and burritos. Uh, and we got into the edge of the storm and there were just amazing clouds. And these little rain squalls were kind of passing over. And, and this is one thing I find, if I encounter weather on a trip, that edge, that kind of weather front can just be a really dramatic place to photograph. Uh, you probably want to have an umbrella, some shelter. It's one thing I love about the Sprinter without a whole lot of seats in it. You can just kind of open it up and use it as a shooting platform and stay dry. Um, so I, I was just photographing these incredible cloudscapes that were kind of on the edge of the storm, these little bits of thunderhead that are rolling off. And you know, it, it, sometimes clouds can be an amazing subject just onto themselves. So, you know, I, I, I photograph clouds as we're coming into the Palouse, kind of on the edge of that storm where there's still a blend of light. The sun's kind of cracking through the edge of that storm. And use the truck as both, you know, a platform. Sometimes you're just stopping quick and you can use it as a bit of a brace without getting a tripod out with a long lens, get a little stabilized. And, and really found some dramatic and interesting weather. Uh, as you're getting into the edge of the Palouse, there's a lot of the huge uh, wind power turbines out there. And I really found some of the most dramatic scenes of them. They were right along the edge of the storm where those, where those wind farms were located uh, and had a good time photographing those. 
And I even stopped and did a little bit of time lapse, but you could tell there was a huge rain skull coming towards us. So I backed up, set the, set the camera up inside the van and actually ran time lapse uh, from inside the van, which wound up being really, really good because as you can see, the rain hit us as the time lapse was, was wrapping up. So it's good to have the camera kind of backed up in there. Um, you know, a, a good umbrella could work as well, just as long as you kind of frame it out of the shot, but it's, it's aimed in a way that's gonna protect the camera from the direction that the rain's blowing in. And as we drove into the Palouse, it's getting a little bit late, um, real drama in the sky, but the clouds are getting thicker, and I was thinking to myself, hmm, I don't know how much light we're gonna wind up having. Um, as, uh, you know, one thing that happened, we were shooting all this time lapse and photos of clouds and windmills because on our way in, we planned it stopping at kind of the famed Palouse Falls, and the park was closed. It was just blocked off, and so hmm, we thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll hit it on the way out. We'll just kind of alter our plan. Uh, and then with the storm, we did all this, this windmill and, and, uh, and just cloud shooting. And as we got in towards Steptoe Butte, where we planned on um, photographing sunset, grabbing some dinner and, and camping in the van to photograph sunrise, it really got dark and dreary. You know, we're, we're driving by this farmland and there's just not much. It's kind of a, a depressing scene. There's Steptoe Butte as we're driving up raining and clouded over. It's just uh, a little bit worrisome. You know, here's a, a cell phone photo of the reflections and raindrops of the van. I kind of like this shot though. There's a lot of radio towers up on top. And the thing that I love about this photo is it shows there's a little crack of light on the edge of the horizon right as we're getting towards sunset. And it is just giving me hope, you know, maybe some light would come splitting through that scene. And sure enough, you know, through that little seam in the clouds, I saw this line of light, almost like a Xerox line coming across the printer um, or coming across your scanning bed, just playing across the landscape. And I dashed back to the truck and I got my 200 millimeter um, Nikon, uh, the 200 millimeter F2, the 70 to 200 F2.8 out and just started taking little extractive landscape shots that kind of filled the frame with that beautiful light that was coming through the seam. You know, and we really debated. When we got up there, it was just a total whiteout, raining. You know, there were a group of people sitting in cars just looking depressed because there's no light, obviously, photographers. Um, and, you know, we thought maybe we should just go down to town, get dinner and a beer. And I said, well, you know, we got another hour till sunset. Let's see, maybe a crack will appear. And I think that's one of the keys to getting good photographs is that, is that endless optimism, even in the face of absolute hopelessness. You know, you can be looking at the darkest and dreariest of scene and, and just, you know, maybe there's a little, little crack in the clouds coming. If we'd driven down and been in amongst all these hills and not a pie looking down on them and that had happened, it would have been, would have been just horrific. Because look at, you know, we only had about 15 minutes of this light, but it was really, really nicely timed. And it was that kind of magic, just, just the last bit of light that's coming through sideways and warming the landscape. And, and if you've never been to shoot scenes in the Palouse, it's just this magical landscape. It's actually all of the, the topsoil that was scraped off of Canada during all these different glacial periods. The glaciers would come down and kind of scrape that stone and create this really fine, uh, nice, loamy soil deposits from scraped stone by the glaciers. And it, it deposited it you know, in Washington, kind of at the toe of that glacier, and it kind of blew in and settled into this, this area called the Palouse, and it's just miles deep of amazing, amazing glacial soil. They call it Less, L-O-E-S-S. -S. Uh, and it's, it's just got some of the most beautiful lines and patterns and these farms and textures and colors. It's also wonderful in autumn, but in spring, you just get these vibrant greens. And so, you know, we, we stayed until that last line of light just faded out of the landscape. Uh, we got a little tiny bit of color in the clouds. And, uh, and at that point, the show was over and we went, into, we went into the little town of Palouse, which we found to be incredibly charming, you know, it was nighttime, so not a great time to be around taking photos, but I kind of took note of some things uh, and thought about scenes that might be nice if it was cloudy the next day to just go shoot in town. It was kind of a place where it just seems like time has stood still for about 50 years, and, and it almost looks like it would, it would just be the, an amazing set if you were gonna be producing a show that was in the 50s or, or the 60s or even the 40s, because it would take very little to make it look like you were back in those times, the signs, the buildings, just the cars even. Um, so 
we took note of that, got a good meal, uh, went back up to Steptoe Butte, spent the night in the van and woke up and it was just a dreary, drizzly, no light whatsoever dawn. I'm, I'm not even, you know, this is about the best landscape photo you could take that morning. And so sure enough, we went back into Palouse and you know, one of the tricks when it's an overcast day, it's really nice to photograph street scenes. It's all nice and evenly lit. You can photograph waterfalls and forests with that nice soft kind of cloud cover that, that, that uh, if you think about it, overcast is a little like a studio softbox. It just lights the landscape really evenly uh, and it's a great place to, to shoot details. But the key is to kind of keep the sky out of it. The less sky in the frame, the better because the sky is just going to be kind of be blah but it lights everything else really nicely without any harsh shadows. So it was fun to go and, and photograph kind of this old beautiful street scenes around Palouse. And I really, you know, oh, and we ran into this, this really adorable dog named Elmer uh, in the back of a pickup truck. He, he licked Woody's nose here. Um, and you know, just these, these old scenes in this town, the details, um, love it there. It'd be a great place to take a workshop. You know, and then we went driving around a bit. Uh, it was clear the weather from our forecast were getting worse, so we both, having young families, kind of decided, hmm, you know, we got some great shots from Steptoe Butte. We went exploring, we went to a wildlife refuge. There wasn't too much happening with wildlife right at that moment, and, and so we, we drove around farm country kind of looking for little scenes that we could pick out without too much sky. Um, this little seam with that green seam running up to the barn really stood out to, to my buddy Woody. He's like, stop! And I was glad we did uh, because it really is just a, a neat seam with that old barn and this green leading line kind of snaking into it. Um, you know, we, we, we drove around just looking for interesting details to pick out. And sometimes you'll see a detail like this and you just need to rethink, you know, how do I capture it in a way that, that's even more, a little more compelling, that gives a little feel for place. You know, what do you want to include? What do you not want to include? Well, you know, I don't mind getting this photo with, you know, kind of shows the place with Pullman in the sign, but, but this is the shot that I really like. It just required putting a little bit longer lens on it and filling the frame a little bit more. Uh, you know, and we drove around kind of making the best of things. Um, the weather was occasionally, there was some texture in the sky and occasionally it was just kind of blah overcast. Sometimes when you see some texture in the clouds like this in post-production with a little contrast um, and a little, you know, if, you, if you're an on one user, you pull some dynamic contrast. If you're a Lightroom user, maybe a little clarity uh, and, and you can get a lot of texture in clouds that have this kind of billowy puffiness to it and differential brighter parts and darker parts, there's shading in there. Um, and they can play really well with the landscape, particularly old barns and, and farm scenes like this. On our way out, we stopped at a really great coffee shop in Colfax. Uh, Colfax is another fun town to visit in the Palouse if you're heading through. And, and the sun came out a little bit for, for part of our drive home and we found some really nice, colorful spring scenes to photograph. You know, I think that the, the final little thing that happened was driving back by Palouse Falls again, they still had it shut down. They just had a road close sign, park closed till further notice. So, you know, we scooted off to the side of the road a bit. I uh, looked on my phone, I didn't see any prohibition on flying drones over state parks in Washington. So I got out my Mavic Pro and flew in to just kind of get an overview of the falls. I wanted to, to at least have looked at it from the air. And so I. I kind of went virtually. I was only about a mile away where we parked, and so I just kind of flew the, the park road in, and uh, from the sky, I took a look at Palouse Falls and got some footage for, for marketing a workshop. And you know, after this one quick little trip, before we headed out, I think we did a really nice job making the best out of some weather that wasn't predicted. It was predicted to be really kind of beautiful, partly cloudy, um, puffy clouds, and instead we got just such thick, heavy, uh, thunderstorm activity and, and kind of a blanketed uh, situation with lots of rain and you just have to adapt you know I, I remember taking a, a class years and years ago from from the great National Geographic photographer Bob Christ and, and a good friend of mine now who you know he said on these travel shoots you just have to adapt um, you, you deal with the situation that you're given when you get there and you've got to capture the story you know, it's all about the story that you find and finding a compelling way to use the light and the weather that you're given to capture something unique. And, and you know, I had a wonderful time here, got a feel for the place, got images that I need 
to market and run a workshop and, and the local on the ground knowledge that I need before I'll consider running a workshop in a place. I'd never take people into a place I don't know myself and have it mapped out and found good locations in. Um, so, you know, that's the way I approach going out on a shoot to a place I've never been. I, I spend a little time ahead of time talking to other photographers, finding out about the place. I did my best to scan the weather and pick a good time to go, but you know, obviously the weather uh, can, can sometimes make a fool of you and you just have to kind of adapt to it. It was a real surprise to not have Palouse Falls open, but the technology that we have available now, you know, the little Mavic Pro drone that I have by DJI fits into the smallest of, of little Pelican cases and I can have it with me in the van and just deploy it whenever I need it. You know, it can even replace a long lens in my photo bag on a backpacking trip and it just gives you another vantage point, a whole nother view. I've actually been expanding my work with drones and having a ton of fun with it. And when you have interesting clouds and dynamic weather, time lapse is a really great way to to capture a story of a place you know that weather playing through the scene time lapse is amazing to just be able to speed up and slow down motion and, and look at it in a whole different way um, and and i'll be talking more about time lapse and approaching the scenes to come so i'm going to jump in talk to a couple or address a couple of questions that I've gotten. Um, I have a question from Jim, who, like me, is a, is a Lightroom and on one user. He says, uh, when using Lightroom, uh, when using Lightroom as, or on one as a plugin for Lightroom, I find that I'm unable to crop or use HDR in on one. And is there a solution to this? And I, I think it, if you're using Lightroom to organize your images, uh, which I often do, and then on one's effects to finish edit your images and some of the amazing masking capabilities that they have with that. Uh, you have to remember that their HDR is designed to blend three raw files together. Uh, and so you can't take three files in from Adobe. You're going to be creating a PSD file and sending it in and one at a time to work on in Lightroom. So doing HDR processing, if you want to do it in on one, and I actually kind of prefer the, the, the HDR processing in on one to Lightroom system, and for a few reasons I can talk about in a second, uh, you're, you're going to need to uh, do that as a standalone in on one. You just need to open those files and, and just browse to the files in on one and do that HDR processing and build that raw HDR file in on one. Lightroom also has great HDR processing. The only thing that on one does that Lightroom doesn't is it allows you to pick which of the images is the one you want to stick with so far as ghosting. So if you have waves flowing through an ocean scene and one of those three or five images that you want to blend into an HDR file to get more dynamic range, one of those has a preferred look to the wave patterns flowing through, you can say that's the one I want you to blend the other ones into and I want it to look like that one. Lightroom doesn't give you that option. It's just going to kind of blend the three with its own algorithm and you're going to wind up with a waveform however it is. So that's kind of the one thing that really stands out to me about the way that on one does HDR is it gives you control over which is used for the base image for ghosting purposes. Um, both of them do a wonderful job creating HDR. So you can create your HDR image in on one and then you know, export it as a TIFF file and just synchronize that folder in Lightroom and have it there. Um, you could also just blend your images into an HDR in Lightroom and then post-process them in, in on one the same way. And it's kind of the same thing when you think about it for, a, for cropping images. Uh, in on one cropping is a raw process. It's not really cropping away those pixels. When you bring an image from Lightroom into on one, you're creating a new file, whether it's a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG to work on in on one. And it's, you know, you're not working on the raw data. So bringing it back into Lightroom, it, it wouldn't see that crop since it's kind of a virtual crop the way that the crop tool works in on one. It's more of a standalone tool, but Lightroom has a wonderful cropping system too. So you can just take the file, organize it in Lightroom, process it in on one if you want, uh, you know, as a PSD or a TIFF or a JPEG, and then crop that result in Lightroom any way you want. Um, that's my, 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 if you're a Lightroom user that uses on one to finish edit your images, I'd just say do your cropping and your HDR processing in Lightroom. I think that's probably a better workflow. So then Rick says, Hudson, in episode four, the last episode I did in Aruba about photographing action and kiteboarding, 
at about seven minutes and 47 seconds in the video, the man dragging his hand in the water kiteboarding, did you use a flash to illuminate him or is that done entirely in post since you're shooting into the sun? I'm gonna throw up that image right now. And that, everyone, is the magic of what Sony's sensors do, whether they're in the Nikon cameras or whether they're in the Sony cameras, they have tremendous, tremendous dynamic range. So that is entirely done in post-production. All of that tonal information was there in the raw file. Even though I'm shooting directly into the sun, there's a little bit of a sea haze kind of diffusing that sun. On the back of the camera, it looked almost silhouette. The sun looked a little bit bright. I was shooting that with a 50 millimeter prime. I cropped in a bit, straightened it a bit, and pulled the shadow detail out and push the highlight detail back a little bit before finish editing it and on one, I did a few local adjustments and on one with some masking and, and just was able to kind of paint a little bit more brightness into that guy with, with the perfect brush, the perfect masking brush that it only really was working on him and his kiteboard just to make him stand out a tiny bit more. And it really does look like I used a, a really, really well lit um, and gelled light to match that sunset light. But in reality, that's all ambient light and that's all the benefit of having the kinds of sensors that they're putting in the top Nikons and Sonys right now that have so much dynamic range. It's a real game changer as far as I'm concerned. Okay, everyone, so that's this particular episode of Approaching the Scene. Again, you know, I hope if you enjoyed it, you'll click like, you'll click subscribe. And you know, if you have questions, I really want you to join the conversation. Submit those questions. You can send them to questions at hudsonhenry.com or go to hudsonhenry.com ATS. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time.